the lovely music. Good morning. I'm Judy West, and I'd like to welcome you on this beautiful and to this new normal, a new and safe way to worship together. Always remembering, as in Matthew 18, 20, that where two or three or more are gathered in Christ's name, so will God be there. God will be here to bring us comfort and peace. Now moving on to announcements. Make sure you click on the bulletin on Stone's website so you can follow along with the service. First, I'd like to welcome the Reverend Dr. Amy Moiso, who will be our guest preacher today. In the not too distant past, she was a parish associate to Stone while working at Santa Clara University. She is now living in Nashville and temporarily working part-time at Westminster Presbyterian. You can read her more detailed bio on the last page of the bulletin under announcements. Also take note, today is the last day to sign up for the Black Lives Matter and Stoneworks listening groups. The link for signing up is in the bulletin. Once signed up, you will be notified by one of the group facilitators regarding dates and times. We also need tech ushers slash deacons. If that is something you'd like to do, Jody Lax has created a sign up genius for anyone who is interested. Just click on the link in the announcements section. Finally, Sharon LeClaire's book, Psalms for People Like Us, is available for purchase. If that is something you would like to have, you can email Sharon and she will give you all the particulars. Once again, all the info is in the announcements section of the bulletin. Now, let us continue to prepare for worship. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Oh, give thanks to God. Call on God's name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Sing to God. Sing praises to God. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Sing to God. Sing praises to God. Tell of all God's wonderful works. Glory in God's holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek God rejoice. Remember the wonderful works God has done, God's miracles and the judgments God has uttered. God is mindful of the covenant forever, of the word that God commanded for a thousand generations. We will now sing our opening hymn, 458, Earth and All Stars.
to the call to confession. Friends, we come now before our God to confess our sin and the sin of the world. We do this trusting in God's gracious and steadfast love and seeking to take away the power of sin in our lives. Let us pray. Almighty God, you love us, but we have not loved you. You call, but we have not listened. We walk away from our neighbors in need, wrapped in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, help us to admit our sin, so that as you us in mercy, we may repent, turn to you, and receive forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Hear now this assurance. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who revere God. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news for all of us this day. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Join us now in the passing of the peace liturgy. May we receive and offer the peace that Christ offers. The, the peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with you. And also with you. The, the peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with, with our neighbors, our friends, friends, and our families. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with the stranger, our enemies, those who are feared. And also with you. The peace of Christ be with the world and all of God's beloved. And also with you. Sisters and brothers and siblings in Christ, let us be at, a, at peace with ourselves and with all whom we meet. Amen. Amen. And I understand now that this is the chaos moment of worship. Um, we will be changing from speakers to gallery view. You can collect, click on the gallery view up in the right-hand corner of Zoom so that you can see everyone. And you can scroll along on the right side. There's a little... Ah, there we go. Hey, Dan. Looks like I got muted there, but now's your big chance to send the piece to everyone else. So I think Michelle's going to hey. unmute us. You can be invited to be unmuted and go for it. Okay. Peace be with you. Peace, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Peace. San Jose again. Good to see you. Hi. Hi. Good to see you. 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 Good the music <laughs> Love the music we listen now to God's word. This is the gospel reading, Matthew 13, verses 31 to 33, and 44 to 52. The parable of the mustard seed. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. The parable of the yeast. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Now three parables. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, 
he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Finally, the treasures new and old. Have you understood all this? They answered yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The word of God. children's sermon today. Today our topic, topic is going to be on love. There's so many ways you could show love to anybody of you know. One example is to any of your family or friend you could help them out in, around the house. Another thing you could do is write a letter to someone you miss. You could even help a stranger. Something that you could do to help your, to help entertain yourself is talking to your friend to a friend. Since we since not only is it summer, but we are but we all have to stay home. Talking to a friend might be some might be something you would like to do. As kids, something we have abundance of is love. 
And one reason why you want to show love to everybody is because Jesus loved us so much that we want to share that gift with anybody we, we, can, we know. Those are all examples of love. To all the children, join me as we sing this song about love. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they're all precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Let us pray. Thank you, God. <clears throat> Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for giving us children and abundance in love. And thank you. And we pray that anybody who receives this gift can pass it on to ever to anybody. Amen. There we go. I think I'm on now. So it's so great to see all of you, um, even from far away, two time zones away. It's almost lunchtime here. So... Um, I'll try and hold off my hunger until uh, I'm done preaching at least. Um, anyway, it's great to see you all. Um, here is our second scripture reading today. It comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans. Chapter 8, verses 26 to 39, a very familiar passage. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. For those whom God foreknew, God also predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom God predestined, God also called. Those whom God called, God also justified. And those whom God justified, God also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? God, who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will God not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through God who loved us. For I am convinced that neither, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, this is the word of the Lord for us this day. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Gracious God, we give thanks for the chance to be together even at a distance and to hear your word as it comes to us today. Make it alive for us. Make it true for us that we might follow in your footsteps. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've been working at a church here in Nashville, as was mentioned, Westminster Presbyterian. I started there um, in January, and then it became clear that there weren't going to be a whole lot of other options. So I've stayed for a while <laughs> because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And as you, as you might imagine, much of our conversation as a staff at that church has been about the pandemic, um, if and when we might reopen the building, um, and under what conditions, who has to wear masks, can you be outside or inside? How many at a time, et cetera, et cetera. Our church also houses a preschool. So we've been following the local school district deliberations to figure out what to do with the preschool. 
And there are a lot of private schools in Nashville. So, and they make their own decisions about reopening and when and how. So currently school is supposed to start on August the 4th and it will be online through Labor Day at least. Meanwhile, I've been talking to my brother about his school plans. He's a middle school teacher in Idaho. His district still hasn't made a decision, but they've been polling parents to see what the parents want, which may or may not be a great idea because the parents are totally divided over everything from virtual learning to mask wearing. Um, my brother said that 49% of the parents wanted the kids to wear masks in school, but they wanted 60% of them wanted to wear, wanted the kids to wear masks on the buses. So that gives you an idea of the kind of decisions they're trying to make. The first day of school for my brother is supposed to be August the 18th, and they don't have a plan yet. The other day I saw this going around Facebook from an eighth grade teacher in Minneapolis. Let's see if I can get this to share for you all. Oops. That is coming later. Oh, come on, my, my plan is not working. <laughs> Give me one second to get the technical work in here. We are all learning how to do these technical things and sometimes they do what we want and sometimes they don't. There we go. Now I think we're ready. This is what I saw going around Facebook. For those of you who aren't looking at a screen right now, it says, it's a meme and it says, Going back to school in school buildings in the fall is a bad idea. Doing distance, distance learning in the fall is a bad idea. Some combination of the two is a bad idea. I do not have any better ideas. I hate global pandemics. This seems to be a common sentiment these days. When it comes to figuring out what we should do with students and schools for the fall semester of 2020 in the United States of America, there are really no good options. Certainly there are safer and less safe options, cheaper and more expensive options. There are do the best you can for as many as you can options. There are first come first served options. And there are prioritize those most at risk and most in need options. But as we all know, even the best options aren't very good. This is not because teachers and administrators are not trying. It's not because schools and parents have just given up. It's not because we do not have, a, have the creativity or the fortitude or the will to try to make the best of a bad situation. It's because the situation is just that bad. There really aren't good options. And kids and teachers and staff and their families will suffer as a result. Sometimes there really are no good options. Things are just that bad. Right now feels like one of those times. In the middle of today's text from Romans, Paul writes this, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, those who are called according to God's purpose. They are predestined and called and justified and glorified. There now, don't we all feel better? Paul tells us things work together for good if we love God and everything is predestined for those who are called. That should settle it, right? But somehow during a global pandemic, these verses do not feel reassuring to me. If anything, they feel uncomfortable, maybe even like a trap. Paul's words might mean on the one hand that things aren't going very well in this country, that things aren't working for good, because none of us is truly loving God enough or following God's call. That doesn't sit very well. Even worse is the alternative, that in the midst of a pan pandemic, the Christian response is a superficial platitude, that everything's going to be okay. But everything is not okay. A pandemic itself is bad enough, but the poor judgment and failures of leadership and wasted opportunities that have greatly exacerbated human suffering are not okay. People of color being subjected to disrespect, mistreatment and violence for centuries is not okay. Federal troops attacking nonviolent protesters is not okay. God works all things together for good for those who love God, all things even terrible things? 
Are the terrible things really predestined, justified, glorified? Somehow, if this beautiful, poetic, reassuring text from Paul is used to just gloss over human-made suffering because it will all be okay in the end, well, that's not okay either. C.S. Lewis wrote a book, a novel called Paralandra. It's about an Eden-like planet of paradise that has not experienced a fall into sin. A man from Earth is sent to the planet to try to keep the inhabitants from succumbing to temptation and committing that first sin. As the man looks around at the wonders of paradise, untouched by sin and suffering and pain, he concludes, God can make good use of all that happens, but the loss is real. God can make good use of all that happens, but the loss is real. The sin of the world causes real loss, real pain, real suffering. And it is within that real suffering that we find ourselves. Some days it is just crushingly real. Paul knows the loss is real. It is there on our breath, in our sighs too deep for words when we don't know how to open our schools safely and we don't know how to educate kids well at home and we know that kids and their families are already struggling and that the weakest and most vulnerable are most likely to be left behind. In these chapters in Romans, Paul is making an argument about the salvation of humanity through Jesus Christ. In fact, it's about the salvation of the whole creation. And today's passage is the capstone it's the final reassurance for those who believe and follow Jesus. Affirmation of the unshakable love of God in whom we have hope. This love of God knows our weaknesses and meets us there. It is love that comes to us through the Spirit when our prayers are so deep, they are wordless groans and sighs. It is love that is for us. It is love in favor of, cheering for humanity. It is love that is present even when it's hard to see, even when there are no good options and we're out of ideas and the loss is real and exhausting and feels never ending. I don't believe Paul's intention is to justify suffering. I believe Paul is justifying keeping hope alive when there aren't good reasons to. It may even be that Paul is arguing that we can't let suffering win. That precisely in the face of suffering is when we need to look each other in the eye and say, we were told this could happen. Keep hope alive. This is not the last word. A lot has been written about Representative John Lewis in recent weeks, especially since his death, but also in light of the renewed action and protest for racial equality and justice. I suspect most of us have already, already know the stories of his multiple arrests and beatings as he protested nonviolently during the civil rights movement. Since I now live in Nashville, I have the privilege of sharing proximity with that history. Let me show you this photo. It popped up earlier. So this is in our downtown public library. It has a civil rights a room that looks out onto Church Street and 7th Avenue, where the lunch counter sit-ins were organized by John Lewis and other students from local black colleges. So his quote is above him on the wall there. I read this week that John Lewis was arrested at least 45 times. In one of his most famous mugshots, he's smiling because as he put it, I was on the right side of history. Keep hope alive. This is not the last word. This week I've been hearing stories about friends in Portland, as you all might remember, I'm from Portland, who've been joining the Wall of Moms, a group of women in yellow t-shirts who are forming a human barrier between Black Lives Matter protesters and federal troops in downtown Portland. The moms wear bicycle helmets and homemade masks and they link arms and sing songs. Some of them were joined this week by dad, wielding hockey sticks and to knock back tear gas canisters and carrying leaf blowers to dissipate the fumes. 
These are ordinary folks who are turning up in the dark to take a stand. It is tempting to glorify their efforts, but in truth, what they're doing is coming to the realization that others have been facing persecution and peril and sword. So instead of staying home and minding their own business, these folks are joining the ranks of those who have already been fighting the battle. A poet named Lynn Ungar wrote about these protesters and their leaf blowers. This is what she says. Leaf blowers are an instrument of the devil. They snarl from across the street when you're trying to sleep and pollute the air with dust and gas and pointlessly blow leaves around for the next gust to bring right back where they started. Good people use a rake or a broom as God intended. I knew this clear as day until the dads showed up at the protest, joined the wall of moms with fists upraised, singing, hands up, don't shoot, in tones that could comfort a baby. The dads brought hockey sticks to bat away the canisters of tear gas and leaf blowers to disperse the gas back whence it came. I don't trust anyone who tells me what God intends. Nonetheless, I will tell you this. God means for us to use the tools that we have on hand to protect what is threatened and growing. Keep hope alive. This is not the last word. And so good people, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or a pandemic or face masks or persecution or quarantine or famine or Fox News or nakedness or suppressed voting or protests or peril or tear gas or sword? No. All of these things are no match for the love of Jesus in which we find our hope. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Keep hope alive. This is not the last word. Amen. Amen, Amy. Thank you for a fabulous sermon. There's hardly a more beautiful way to speak about the hidden promise of even the smallest gift than the image of that mustard seed we just heard about in the scripture reading. The seed so tiny, yet holding so much possibility. Like the seed, we are gifts of God. Perhaps we feel small, but we hold the promise of God's awesome power at work within us. We share our gifts this morning so that we can build a better world for those who seek refuge, justice, acceptance, and love. Let us now gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise.
going to go ahead with the prayer of dedication. Let us pray. God, creator of all, we bring forth our humble gifts. May they serve you, our community, our nation, our world. May your wisdom and love make our souls serene. We ask all this in your name. Amen. One of the things that we know we can do together, even if we're not in the same physical space together, is to pray. We pray because prayer changes things. So wherever we are this day, let us join our hearts together as we pray for our churches, our world, our nation, and our lives. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and loving God, we gather our hearts together in prayer this July Sabbath day. We turn to you, O Lord, remembering you and relying on you to help us, to guide us, and to give us strength and love. Create in us a spirit of kindness and help us to think about our friends, our families, our neighbors, how we can help them and how we can allow them to help us. Amidst our multi-front anxieties of this crazy time in history, help us to search for and find your true peace. Calm our fears. Create in us courage by enabling us to see your light even in the darkest situations. Into our confusion, let us find wisdom. Into evil divisions, let us find the way to create love and peaceful connections. This morning, we pray for all of those who are experiencing illness of any kind. Heal their bodies and mend their souls. We especially ask for you to touch into some of our Stone Church family and friends. At home, feel free at this time to say the names of those you are concerned about. Further to, to name a few known, Walter Roach, Chris Lee, Phil Curtis, Marge Palmer, Vern Teeger, Werner Croker, Roberto Ramirez, Lois Shepard, Pat McGee, Glenda Bowman, Michelle Edwards and her dad, Homer Riley. Please God protect all of those who are affected by the coronavirus, both directly and indirectly. Keep them safe and help them heal. Be with the nurses and doctors, surgeons, scientists, and paramedics as they seek the care for overloads of patients and to heal them and create vaccines in record time. Bring caregivers and first-line workers wisdom and insight and keep them strong themselves. Help all caregivers to be renewed and to find the rest and endurance they need to continue to serve as they would like. We pray for those who are most vulnerable in this world. Help us to continue to be the hands and feet of Christ, bringing healing, attention, and love to all of those in need, whether it be hunger, shelter, or just plain human contact. Give us joy and laughter to share with one another in our communities, along with food and safety and justice. Holy God, we pray for the leaders of our nation and our world. With your power, may they be awakened to a spirit of wisdom and courage and unselfishness that they might lead rightly and with justice, driven by compassion for all people. We pray especially for real racial justice to find the real hold of the hearts of all people across this land and the world. We pray for the family of John Lewis as they grieve his loss this past week. May the lessons of his time on earth become a foundation for major changes as the phrase Black Lives Matter becomes a call of our day. We pray for your creation, God. Help us to care for all that you have given us. Make us faithful stewards Guide our actions, help us to resist taking more than our fair share. May we learn to treat the earth with respect and love in all manners. Fill us with the spirit of generosity and a sense of security that we may feel free of fear and filled with your spirit of abundance and sufficiency. 
O God of all creation, we pray for this church and all churches of all places, that even as we worship in separate places and at different times, bind us together into one human family. Help us, we would, who would choose to follow Christ's teachings, to be the body of Christ, loving and serving the world and all the peoples that you have created. So even now, in all our different places in this Zoom congregation, we join our voices together with the voice of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, now as we go out into the rest of our day, remember that life is short and we have little time to gladden the hearts of those who walk this way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the love of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with us all this day and forevermore. And all God's people said, amen. <laughs>